Look at that, Mom. Look at that. I see it. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That's it. There's one coming right at us. Oh, my God. It's a blue. Terrifying images there. At least six tornadoes and severe weather across three states, killing at least three people. Millions in the Midwest are reeling from the destruction as rescue crews are racing to try to find survivors among all that rubble. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. Starting tonight in Ohio, where officials confirmed three people have been killed after tornadoes. The storms have been devastating. Homes are missing their entire second floors. Crews moving in with heavy equipment to check out the rubble. And a man who says he didn't have a basement to hide in explained how he rode out the storm. Take a listen. I got against the couch, got against a chest freezer, and put some pillows over the dog grabbed a big heavy sleeping bag off the couch and put it over me and the dog and about that time to put it bluntly all hell broke loose in indiana rescue teams are on the ground also searching for victims using dogs to try to find people who might still be pinned under some of that destruction there so much of the damage happening in the dark and when the daylight came it was miles and miles of rubble in kentucky the governor there has declared a state of emergency after the most active severe weather day of the year so far with more than 300 storm reports we've got a team monitoring the latest conditions tonight nbc news meteorologist bill karens is tracking where that system is headed now but first, let's go to NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster in Logan County, Ohio. Shaq, that is so much damage behind you there. How are people doing in the aftermath? Yeah, and Gotti, let me actually show you a little bit more of it because the damage is widespread. People here talk about the damage not in terms of blocks, but in terms of miles. And you see this one building behind me. It's hard to tell what it even was. There's both the stove and the vending machine. You see further in the distance, you have homes. And just look at those trees. Uh, these trees are completely splintered. You see some residents already doing what they can to start picking up the pieces. And Gotti, if you imagine what it was like being here, that's when it gets even more tragic. I spoke to Susan, who was in a different area uh, of town, a couple blocks away. It's an area where we frankly can't get reception out of right now. But listen to what she told me about her experience in hunkering down and dealing with the tornado as it went out overhead. The wind just, you know, picked up was so fast that it just took a roof and then just blew me down the hall. You saw your roof? Yeah fly off yeah what did yeah. you think when you saw that help <laughs> i didn't know if i'd make it it was really scary she told me later that she was lucky she felt lucky to be alive her husband who just went through a surgery was back in the hospital in the wake of that but she says that he is going to do okay Gotti, you hear story after story as you see home after home with that kind of damage Oh, we're so grateful she made it out okay. Have officials said how long it could take to recover there? A long time. We heard from the governor, Mike DeWine, a little bit earlier today, and he warned that this is going to be a long process. He said the, it's not just going to be on local officials and local authorities and resources, but that there's going to be state resources and likely federal resources coming in. Because you're not only talking about displaced homes and damaged businesses, but this is an almost touristy area in this, uh, in this state. The Indian Lakes are right behind us. So he acknowledged that with summer coming up with the weather starting to heat up he wants businesses to get back on their feet as much as they can by the time they get to that summer season it's not clear if they will be able to but definitely uh, he says they're going to try and no matter what he said that this neighborhood will be back and Shaq, speaking of the seasons i mean technically it's still winter right we're already seeing tornadoes right. is, is that normal 
No, it's definitely not normal, Gotti. We talked to our weather unit, and they made the point of, yes, this is still technically uh, tornado season, so that's not unusual. But to have this many tornadoes, these uh, the scale of tornadoes this early in the season, that is particularly unusual. And they point to the warming climate and say that this is part of a shifting pattern, shifting weather patterns that we're seeing. So to have nine states impacted by this one system to have yesterday be a day where you had 300 storm reports across the country. That is certainly unusual in it happening this early, especially as you mentioned, it's still being technically winter. Shaquille Brewster, thanks so much. And let's turn now to NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens for more on the aftermath of those deadly tornadoes and severe thunderstorms in the south that could pack some heavy hail as well. Hey, Bill. Scotty, what a severe weather outbreak. And the number of tornadoes, now that we've actually had daylight, we actually went out and saw them. We you know, monitored how strong they were. And by the way, that one in Indiana was an EF3 tornado. So likely that'll some be somewhere between maybe 120 to 160 mile per hour winds. So in all, 17 tornadoes were up to from this outbreak. Pretty incredible how widespread it is, too. I mean, we had tornadoes reported in Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, uh, Arkansas. Arkansas and Texas with this event and a ton of hail was reported throughout the region and what I think you know obviously if you've seen the pictures it's incredible we haven't had more fatalities so many manufactured homes damaged and this is the reason why so this is Winchester Indiana that's where the EF3 tornado hit and then Lakeview was also hit very hard these areas had a good heads up and the people in the manufacturing homes knew to get out of those when the storms were approaching. So the first tornado warnings were issued at 739, 727 p.m., almost at very similar times. And then they had about a 24 to 22 minute lead time before the tornado hit. So those extra minutes saved a lot of lives and a lot of less people injured too. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. It also helped that these were spotted as the sun was setting. We still had eyes. Storm chasers knew the, where the tornadoes were. So this wasn't quite an overnight tornado event. So that saved lives also. We have been dealing with severe storms during the day today. We're mostly concerned now with what's left in areas of Texas. If we get any strong storms throughout, you know, into the overnight hours, likely from San Antonio to Laredo to Del Rio, large hail is the biggest threat. And this is area has Hatched area shows where we have the potential, at least, for large storms with two inch hail. And that's enough, you know, tennis ball size to cause dents in cars and also to break a couple windshields, too. And so on Saturday, that slight risk continues in the same area. So two days in a row, we're going to have a chance to strong storms throughout this region. And this is how it's going to play out. So on Saturday, we're going to see those storms in Texas. And then this storm system is going to roll right along the Gulf Coast. So Sunday looks like a soaker. Fast moving storms from New Orleans, Panama City, Mobile, and by 8 p.m. Sunday should be reaching Jacksonville up here towards Brunswick and possibly into Savannah. So here's how the weekend forecast looks. Everyone east of the Mississippi, fantastic Saturday. Still you know, soaking storms, maybe some severe weather in areas of Texas. No problem, pretty mild. We'll take the mid-70s in the Pacific Northwest. By the time we get to Sunday, west coast is clear, still dealing with that heavy rain on the Gulf Coast, but nothing like that severe weather outbreak, Gotti, that we had last night. Hopefully we don't do that again anytime soon. And turning now to that drama-filled saga in Fulton County, Georgia, and a case that's supposed to be all about whether Donald Trump interfered with the election. Today, the judge basically telling the district attorney, Fannie Willis, that if they want to move forward, she either quits the case or her former boyfriend, the lead prosecutor, quits. And pretty quickly after that, we heard from the lead prosecutor, Nathan Wade, saying he was stepping down in the interest of democracy. His ex-girlfriend, the DA, thanking him for his patriotism and courage. Now, remember, Trump's lawyers had tried to get them off the case, alleging the relationship was a conflict of interest. But today, the judge also added the defense failed to prove there was an actual conflict of interest. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us now. Blaine, the judge says there's no conflict of interest here, but also like either Fonny or Wade had to go. It sounds kind of like no one got what they wanted here. Yeah, it was a partial win for both sides, Gotti. So he said that there was no actual conflict of interest, but there was certainly an appearance that just didn't look good. So basically, what the judge was saying in his ruling is that legally there's no reason to disqualify you. He certainly stood on that, but it just didn't look good. And he had no issue taking Fonnie Willis to task. 
over a few things, basically saying he made some bad judgment calls here uh, on a couple of things, pointing to that uh, stunning testimony that we all watched play out live where she was on the stand for two, uh, two minutes. He called that unprofessional conduct. And then also just overall kind of pointing to her, her conduct uh, and this relationship during the course of this, uh, this trial. So what are the chances of this case happening before the presidential election? It's very unlikely that it'll go to trial before the presidential election. Initially, Fannie Willis had wanted a trial start date of early August. That seemed ambitious even before we kind of spun mm -hmm. off into this two and a half month delay looking into this motion to, to remove her. So given the fact that it's now been essentially ground to a halt for two and a half months, that August 5th timeline is almost certainly not happening. And it's very unlikely that we'll see this go to trial before the election. And Blaine, this caught my eye, but when it comes to the judge and, and Fonnie Willis, they've got kind of a history. Wasn't she his boss at one point? How does this impact their dynamic going forward? Yeah, they both worked for the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Before she was DA, she was an assistant DA and kind of supervised the division in which he was a prosecutor. But I think that all of the legal people involved in this will say that, you know, legal lines kind of intersect in many different ways. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't rule in accordance with the law. And so what we've seen so far is that, yes, she has been trying this case before him and there are likely many more to come. But we wouldn't expect uh, their personal friendship or just kind of knowing each other uh, over, over the course of time to come into that. And I think that that was held true in that we've already seen uh, Judge McAfee rule in a couple of ways, or even his strong wording today in that uh, ruling where he doesn't hesitate to take her to task, makes it clear that, yes, this is somebody that I've known professionally, and she's even kind of referred to him as a baby lawyer, saying he's very talented in an interview. But when they're doing their jobs, they are doing that and focus solely on the law. Got it. Good old adversarial justice system. Blaine Alexander, thanks so much. Hey, don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, people are desperate for aid in Gaza, and some reports say the situation is so bad, people have been forced to eat animal feed. NBC's Richard Engel has the latest from the ground there. Plus, a shooting during rush hour on a New York City subway train. This comes just a week after the governor says the National Guard is stepping into patrol stations. What in the world's going on with the city's subway system? We're going to explore that. And later, license plate vigilante. Meet the man who's made it his mission to keep New Yorkers safe by sniffing out doctored up plates. You're going to either love this guy or the opposite, so don't go anywhere. And here's a court officer placard, court officer placard. You're going to love this one. He's covered his plate with a little sticker. Hey, welcome back. The international community is still scrambling to figure out how to respond to the chaos in Haiti. That story in just a moment. But first, here's a quick look around the world. A Russian missile attack has killed at least 20 people in the Ukrainian port city of Odessa today. The attack was aimed at a civilian target, and officials there are calling this one of Russia's deadliest attacks in weeks. President Vladimir Zelensky says his military will do everything to make sure, quote, Russian killers feel our fair response. And Russians are starting to head to the polls today as their three-day election kicked off. But with Alexei Navalny, the only meaningful opposition dead, uh, Vladimir Putin victory seems all but certain. That'll stretch Putin's rule for at least the next six years. And while TikTok's future in the U.S. hinges on the Senate, China is not going down without a fight. Today, Chinese officials signaled they will not allow a forced sale of the app. Execs there have interpreted that as meaning China would rather have the TikTok banned in the United States than be forced to sell. And Major League Baseball superstar Shohei Otani is greeted today by massive crowds after arriving in South Korea ahead of the L.A. Dodgers' first game of the season. Here he is with his wife, who is a pro basketball player in Japan. The Dodgers open the season against the San Diego Padres in Seoul on March 20th. And the violence in Haiti continues to spiral. Today, the U.S. announced it would be sending $25 million in humanitarian aid there, but that does little to calm the fears that Haitian Americans are feeling as their families remain trapped on the island, surrounded by unchecked violence. Our very own Guad Venegas caught up with some of them in Florida. You have family that is still in Haiti. Yes, sir. Have they thought about leaving the country? Well, Haiti is... Haiti will always be home. My mom, she loves the country to death. You know, she, uh, she, she comes here and visit, but her heart is Haiti. 
She says that no matter how it is here, it'll never be home. That's the reason why they want to stay. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson with the latest. Uh, Priscilla, so there's supposed to be this curfew in Haiti right now for another three days, but with no government, how is that even enforced? Yeah, Gotti, the government is effectively shut down with the prime minister saying that he will step down once a transition council is in place, but that council is not yet in place and the prime minister hasn't been able to get back in the country, but there is still a national police presence in Haiti. And so the hope there may be that having that curfew will mean that average citizens and a large subset of the population will not be out at night and those national police may be able to target target those armed gangs that are still going to be out looting and damaging state property in the hopes of being able to sort of tamp down on some of that violence as they can as they continue to struggle to get the situation under control, Gotti. And I hate to say it, but it seems like the gangs got part of what they wanted now that the prime minister is basically out. But, but what's next? Is this the calm before the storm? What, what's going to happen? Yeah, they definitely got what they wanted. And so now the Caribbean nations have gathered to attempt to put together this uh, transition council. Uh, Anthony Blinken says that most of the nine people that are going to sit on that council are in place, but not all of them. And in the meantime, one of the biggest gang leaders in Haiti has said that no Haitian politician should sit on that council, effectively threatening any of them that might attempt to do that. And what he's saying is that Haitians should have an opportunity to govern themselves and decide who they want to govern them. An important context, Haiti has not had an election in eight years, and even scholars and advocates uh, in Haiti are saying that uh, this foreign interference is part of the reason for the turmoil and the instability in the country. And so it's really unclear the path forward and what is actually going to work here as folks try to get things under control there. And Priscilla, when it comes to the Haitian immigration and the United States. It looks like the Biden administration right now is getting hit from both sides. We've got Republicans who are worried that we're going to see this massive influx of Haitian immigrants, while some progressives, on the other hand, are blasting the administration for continuing to deport Haitians right now straight back into all that violence. Is there a plan in place for what to do about all the Haitian refugees that we could see soon? Well, Gotti, nothing has changed in terms of U.S. immigration policy. But to your point, it is becoming a flashpoint and a very hot button issue. We saw uh, former President Trump accusing Biden of having open border policies that have allowed thousands of Haitian migrants to flood into the country. But we've also heard from the Department of Homeland Security saying that immigration from of undocumented migrants from Haiti is low. And in fact, just yesterday, the Coast Guard sent a boat with some 65 Haitian migrants in it back to the country, back to that violence uh, that you were just talking about. And they said that that is the policy, that that is not a safe way to come to the country. And in order to deter people from doing that, they will send them back. And DHS has said that if folks do have a valid asylum claim and come in through the ports of entry where they can make that claim, then they will process them accordingly. But if not, they are going to be sent back. And at the same time, as you mentioned, you have advocates and scholars who are saying that this is just yet another example of how U.S. immigration policy treats Haitian migrants different from some other subsets of migrants. So certainly becoming a big part of the conversation and yet another issue as we're watching all of that violence unfold in the country. Gotti? NBC's Priscilla Thompson, we appreciate your coverage. Thanks so much. And over in the Middle East, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has approved plans of a ground offensive against Hamas in Rafah. That is Gaza's southernmost city where over a million people have fled trying to escape the war there. The White House says they have not seen these plans and that the civilian protection must be priority. But the news is coming as a long-awaited ship of aid just arrived in Gaza. And NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has the latest. Crews in Gaza tonight are finally unloading this desperately needed food and humanitarian aid off a barge that took three days to be towed from Cyprus. Earlier, Palestinians waited as the most difficult moment approached, docking in the rough seas. The shipment was not sent by a government, but chef Jose Andres Charity 
World Central Kitchen, which refused to wait for a ceasefire or take no for an answer. The group arranged for local truck drivers to gather pieces of destroyed buildings and rubble to create a jetty for the barge. But the relief may be short-lived. Today, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu approved plans for an invasion of the city of Rafah, where some 1.5 million Palestinians are taking shelter. Israel says Hamas is hiding among the civilians. President Biden has called a military operation against Rafah a red line. And today, in another sign of growing tensions with the prime minister, the president praised a speech on Thursday by the Senate's top Democrat, Chuck Schumer, calling Netanyahu an obstacle for peace. He made a good speech, and I think he uh, expressed a serious concern shared not only by him, but by many Americans. Israel is downplaying tonight hopes of a breakthrough after Hamas presented a new proposal to free some of its hostages in exchange for hundreds of Palestinian prisoners. But Israel is nonetheless sending negotiators. Richard Engel, thanks so much. And coming up, ICE agents uh, have been facing criticism over interactions with migrants for years. Well, now body cams could become standard issue. We're going to have those details. But first, check this out. You are looking at the world's heaviest blueberry, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. The golf ball-sized berry was picked back in November on an Australian farm. Now, imagine biting into that juicy little monster that is 10 times the size of your average blueberry. Well, unfortunately, no one's going to be doing that anytime soon because the record-breaking berry has been frozen for now and might even be cast in resin because it is so very important. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. The Supreme Court is out with a new ruling, and this one is interesting. Basically, it says that public officials can be sued for blocking people on social media. The judges ruled unanimously that officials making social media content can be considered what's called state actors, and that means they can face litigation if they block or mute a member of the public. And Uber and Lyft are threatening to call it quits in Minneapolis. This after the city council there voted to give them a guaranteed minimum hourly wage. Both Uber and Lyft basically say that they would be forced to pass the increased cost onto their riders, making their operations unsustainable in the city. The law is set to take effect May 1st. And federal prosecutors want Sam Bankman free to serve at least 40 years behind bars. The FTX co-founder was convicted last November for fraud, and they argue the massive scope of his crimes call for a lengthy sentence. And it looks like the Internet might be getting faster in some places. The FCC is raising Internet minimum speeds. The agency says anything short of 100 megabits per second would, quote, cheat our children, our future, and our new digital economy. And they add that the new standard for Internet service will be better to meet the needs of American households. Firefighters in Los Angeles battled flames for hours at the home of actress Cara Delevingne. A large part of that house was lost. One fighter, fire, fire, firefighter was hospitalized, but he is expected to be okay, and it is still not clear what caused that fire. And there have been questions over how migrants have been treated as they are detained for years, but soon the public could start seeing some of that firsthand. ICE officers will be forced to wear body cams in five major U.S. cities, and NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley has the latest. This is actually making good on a 2022 executive order President Biden signed directing all federal law enforcement agencies to start adopting policies around body-worn cameras. Now, why are we just now hearing about it in 2024? It takes some time. They have to procure the body-worn cameras. They have to figure out where they're going to record, where they're not, and how they're going to store that information. So ICE did a six-month pilot program, and they're launching body-worn cameras in, six, in five U.S. cities where ICE operates, whether they're deporting migrants, arresting migrants, or arresting people who are violating U.S. immigration law. That could mean someone who has done human trafficking or is employing undocumented migrants. All of these ways that ICE interacts with the public, those can now be recorded, at least in these five cities. Now, why not roll it out nationwide? After all, that was what the executive order mandated all of these agencies to do. Well, they say it's a matter of funding. Right now, Republicans are really tightening the purse strings around DHS. They say it's because they disagree with Biden's border policies and that until he does more to curb the number of undocumented migrants crossing the border, they don't want to give more money to 
places like ICE. In fact, ICE has told us they are facing a $500 million shortfall. And come May, they may have to start cutting from key areas like deportations and like the amount of space that they have to detain migrants. So all of this means that they're able to get just this little piece of money to be able to fund these body cameras in five cities. And the main thing to watch here is what comes from it. How easily will the press and other people who are interested, maybe their advocates, be able to get images and footage after a questionable incident that might occur between an ICE officer and a migrant or someone else who they're arresting. So this is just the next phase and what it looks like as we begin to examine the new phase of federal law enforcement as they wear these body-worn cameras. And tonight, a man is in critical condition after being shot on the New York City subway. This is video you might have already seen on social media. A fight broke out last night between two men during rush hour. The man who police say instigated the whole thing was shot with his own gun. Now, police say because the shooting appears to have been in self-defense, it is likely that there will not be any charges. But keep in mind, this is rush hour in New York City. Babies are in that train car. Children are in there. It is packed. And this all happens just one week after Governor Kathy Hochul deployed 1,000 service members to the city subway, including 750 National Guard members. They've now helped police check people's bags after a recent crime wave. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Stephen Romo. Uh, Stephen, so set the scene for us. We've all seen bits and pieces of video from different vantage points of what happened. But can you walk us through what went down? Yeah, one thing in common with all these videos is the panic that this caused just all across that subway platform, Gotti. Yeah, this all started, with police say a 36-year-old man did not pay his fare. He went in one of the emergency exit doors, got on the subway, and this video here, it picks up with another rider recording them. He's arguing with a 32-year-old man and that woman there, he starts hitting him. That woman appears to stab him in the back, and they continue arguing, and then people start trying to flee away. He eventually pulls out a gun, and we don't see this on video, but he somehow, the 32-year-old, wrestles that gun away from him, or he loses control of the gun, and then the 32-year-old man in yellow there, according to police, shot the 36-year-old uh, multiple times, four times, including once in the head. Now, he is still in critical condition. As you mentioned, that man in yellow uh, right now looks like self-defense, and he's not currently facing charges. That woman, though, it's not clear if they are seeking her. She's not in custody right now. It's not clear if she will face charges. But this has just caused uh, so much uh, panic in that subway system. Yeah, and it all comes after after the governor there called in the National Guard to help with safety on the metro. I mean, what happens next? Yeah, it's a great question. If the National Guard is there and this sort of thing can continue to happen, a lot of people are asking what happens next. People have mentioned metal detectors. The NYPD had a press conference today. They said that that's an option that's been talked about many times, but there are a lot of logistical reasons why that can be a problem. Instead, they really focused on trying to, to prevent um, smaller crimes like skipping the fare, like jumping the turnstile to get in the subway for free. They say if they can really focus on those crimes, they think they might be able to prevent the large crimes. And as for the National Guard uh, troops that are in the subway system right now, it's only been a week, so it's hard to tell if that will have an effect. But many people online are pointing out how that did not have an effect on what took place last night. Gotti? Uh, troops along the subway look so weird. Steve Romo, thanks so much. And New York City is on the brink of rolling out its traffic congestion program, charging drivers $15 a pop for driving into midtown Manhattan. And all that infrastructure relies on one important tool, traffic cameras. But there's just one small problem. Those cameras are not working too great for their first job, which is catching speeders. And we talked to one New Yorker who made it his mission to try to change that. New York City is known for its homegrown crime fighters. Spider-Man. Batman. But wait, there's a new crime-stopping vigilante in town. Hey, it's Gersh Kunstman doing what I do best. Hey, it's your buddy Gersh Kunstman of Streets Blog. Hey, it's Gersh Kunstman. You know I'm hiding in plain sight. Gersh Kunstman, a former tabloid reporter turned road safety advocate, is on a mission to stop cheating. License plate cheating, that is. Let's jump back to 2022, when New York City flipped the switch and turned its thousands of traffic speed cameras on 24-7. And it helped slow down drivers, kind of. Because here's the catch. It turns out some New Yorkers are pretty creative when it comes to avoiding traffic tickets. 
normally if you get caught at a speed camera, you get a $50 ticket. But if you've obscured your license plate, you might not get a ticket at all. And that is costing New York a lot of money. The city says ghost plates are one main culprit. So a ghost plate can be a few different things. Some are, t are essentially fake or temporary plates. So there's people counterfeiting those. Other people are just using a marker, you know, and scratching out or kind of covering the numbers. So you might still be able to see a lot of the license plate, but you can't make out one or two of the digits. Mayor Adams vowed to crack down on them. But according to the Comptroller's January audit report, the problem isn't going away. It's actually getting worse. We saw that grow dramatically to where it happened 750,000 times uh, in the six months that the audit reviewed. Inter Gersh Kunzman, he's the editor in chief of Streets Blog and a part time license plate vigilante. There's a lot of techniques that New Yorkers use to cover their plate. Scratching off uh, part of the plate, like an E, can become an S very easily if you just scratch it off. So I've had to go around with a with a black uh, paint pen. I don't use a magic marker, just another pro tip out there. Don't use a magic marker, they're not thick enough. You gotta use a paint pen. And I have two different colors uh, for different types of New York plates. You just repaint it. And it's funny, cause I'll sometimes come along and see like a paleontologist, I'll see different layers on a plate and I'll see some that I've painted and then the person scratched off again and I repainted it. Gersh likes to spice up his morning commute with a little DIY activism. And his X page is dedicated to naming and shaming offenders. Most of the time I'm just going to work. I don't set up these long, elaborate bike rides to find these people, but there's certain hot spots around my office in lower Manhattan. And basically any area where public officials feel that they are in charge and they are the law, you see a lot of it. And get this, he says a lot of the plates he unobscures actually belong to city employees. And here's a court officer placard, court officer placard. You're going to love this one. He's covered his plate with a little sticker. The goal of the Twitter account really was just to shame the NYPD and other pu public officials into seeing like, hey, we know what you're doing. Like, you know, I know, you know. So like, stop doing this. The NYPD responded saying that all vehicles on NYC streets are subject to the laws governing the road, including NYPD employees and public officials, and that officers who are in violation are subject to discipline. I'm no great fan of busting people who are honest people. It's something that he gets such a kick out of that sometimes he sings about it. The cops call it criminal mischief. They'll charge you in the fourth degree. Citizen enforcement, you know, can lead to conflict, which, as Gerst shows, might be entertaining for viral videos, but it's not the best thing for making sure we have a, a safe and, and healthy New York. While the city would like to collect the speeding ticket money, the Comptroller stresses that it all comes down to safety. Really what this is about is saving lives and preventing crashes. So making sure that everybody follows the rules fairly really is a matter of life and death. People ha have lost sight of what these enforcement cameras are all about. It's not a money grab. It's only a uh, enforcement strategy against the most reckless drivers. It, it bears repeating because people think that the government is just coming into your wallet and taking money. It's like, no, you're speeding in a school zone. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for you. <laughs> only in New York. <laughs> Still to come, we've got another update on Alec Baldwin and the Rust movie shooting case. Those details are coming up next, so stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back. We're going to show you some absolutely stunning sights from the California Superbloom in just a second. But first, here's some other stories we're watching out in the West. Alec Baldwin is asking the judge in the Rust shooting case to dismiss his charges. His lawyers filed a motion saying that the whole thing has been a, quote, abuse of the system and that Baldwin is an innocent person whose rights have been trampled. Last week, the film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, was uh, found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Baldwin's trial is set to start in July. And a 58-year-old fertility doctor from San Clemente, California, has been sentenced to 15 years in prison for murdering his wife. Her body was found at the foot of the stairs in a staged accident at their home back in 2016. The trial evidence showed that she actually died during strangulation in a violent struggle between the couple. And vending machines carrying Narcan, that life-saving drug that reverses opioid overdoses, has been or have been installed in Hilo, Hawaii. 
The move comes in an effort to help curb overdose deaths, and the Hawaiian island averages an overdose death every eight days. Narcan doses are free and available 24-7. And travelers are growing more and more frustrated with airlines raising the prices on checked bags, and that's leading a lot of people to push the limits on what they can carry onto a plane. So now airlines are cracking down on carry-on bags as well, and NBC News correspondent Sam Brock breaks it all down. The airline policies are the same they've been for years, but a couple of things are going on right now. We're seeing record-breaking number of passengers, and also the price for checking your bags has gone up for a number of major airlines in recent weeks and months. So people are doing what people do in trying to save money by taking all of their stuff with them on board. Many passengers, though, discovering that things like pillows and blankets and even fanny packs are considered personal items. As one airline describes it, it's not a crackdown. It's a clarification of existing rules. For many travelers trying to jet their way through the airport, the carry-on convenience is also becoming a bit of a conundrum with more than two items. I think it's definitely irritating because, like, sometimes you just have extra stuff. Passengers tired of ever-rising checked bag fees. We pay enough for our tickets, for all the other fees. Are getting to the gate with roller boards and bags and even pillows and packs and hitting roadblocks like this Southwest flyer. I could hear the gate agent saying that if you have a pillow or a blanket that you need to condense it and put it inside of something because it's counted as a carry-on. Southwest Airlines, which does allow passengers two free checked bags, states on its website that personal items can include purses and cross body bags, briefcases, blankets, pillows, not including neck pillows, cameras, food containers, or laptops. Southwest telling NBC News, the crackdown referenced in recent reporting is in actuality a clarification of the already existing policy limiting customers to two items. American Airlines says it focuses on the number of carry-ons and have not made any changes to their policy. So why the apparent crunch on carry-ons? As we've seen check bag prices increase, it's no wonder that there are more bags trying to get fit in overhead bin space. And this can actually affect sort of the boarding process. Mere minutes can affect how many flights airlines can make, occasionally causing confrontation like in Meet the Parents. I'm sorry, sir, you're going to have to check that. I got it. No, I'm sorry, that bag won't fit. We'll no, no, I'm not, the hey, bag. I'm not checking my bag. And less dramatically, in real life, too. Some budget airlines, like Spirit and Frontier, do charge flyers for a carry-on, while basic economy tickets on United or JetBlue are cheaper and allow for a personal item, but add a fee for a carry-on. The web of rules adding up, with carry-ons now coming under the microscope. So what are some tips for trying to be prepared? First of all, if you're flying a low-cost carrier and you know you're going to be taking on a carry-on, pay for it up front when you book. That's the cheapest price that you're going to get. Also, all the airlines have their specifications online, and the bag sizes vary a little bit depending upon airline. Check ahead of time so that you're not surprised. And then volunteer to check your bag at the gate. I know it's not always the most popular option, but at least you can get ahead of the situation so you're not in that delicate dance of trying to figure out, are they going to flag me for this or not? Instead, you'll just be prepared. In Miami, Sam Brock, NBC News. Back to you. Sam Brock, thanks so much. And in so many places around the country, local news coverage is starting to disappear. And for a lot of those small towns, losing a newspaper can have a very big impact. But in Iowa, there are some student journalists that have figured out a way to provide a unique opportunity for not one, but two local papers. And NBC News' Aaron McLaughlin has a story on how they did it. In Mount Vernon, Iowa, the editor of the city's newspaper is scrambling to make deadline. It's a lot of stress. It keeps you up at night at times. Because of factors like cost cuts, this small city of 4,000 completely relies on Nathan Countryman for their local news. He's both editor and reporter of the Mount Vernon Lisbon Sun. When you have engaged readerships, they're making sure you're not missing things, you're not falling asleep at the wheel as an editor. So just after the Countryman's solo struggle is about to change. After the Daily Iowan, a student newspaper purchased the Mount Vernon Lisbon Sun and another local paper in the area. The plan is to have students from the University of Iowa help both papers cover their communities. Did you see the paper today? This is our biggest and boldest <laughs> collaboration. 
expanding the students' coverage beyond their campus of more than 30,000. Student editor Sabina Martin says the move creates valuable learning opportunities. It's one thing to be in a classroom, but to be in a newsroom for a community and meet, meeting the people in the community is super important. While Countryman gets badly needed support. I'll do a story that covers what's happening at the moment, but there's so much more that I could d dive into if I had the resources or time to be able to go focus on this. And you go from having a staff of one or a staff of one and a half on the news side, to all of a sudden you've got an intern and you've got journalism students in classes, it's going to make an immense impact. <laughs> Jason Brumman runs the Daily Iowan and Melissa Tully oversees the school's journalism program. They say the new partnership represents a much needed bridge for a broken industry. I think it's vital that we start to think outside the box on how to fill the void. A recent study from Northwestern University's local news initiative found that since 2005, almost 2,900 newspapers across the country have closed closed, a rate that is expected to accelerate by the end of the year. People do trust their local media and what happens when it goes away? Where are they getting their news and information from? That's a question that we've actually seen the answer to and I don't really like the world in which there's no local media. Across the country, other colleges have purchased local papers, but this partnership is the first of its kind, as the Daily Iowan is a nonprofit paper independent of the university, which Tully says opens up new funding opportunities. Why are we beholden to an economic model that hasn't been working? Our hope is that this maybe serves as inspiration, uh, but beyond that, that we can uh, have proof of concept that this can be successful. Did you do this story? And out in Iowa, success means creating teachable moments while saving a vital but failing industry. Well, this program actually started a few weeks ago, and the thinking is when students return from spring break there at the University of Iowa, they'll be able to intern for their local papers. And then in the fall, the hope is that they'll be able to take a class to contribute actual reporting to those papers. And then in the long term, the focus is very much on funding because the Daily Iowan is this nonprofit student paper. The thinking is that these local papers could then qualify for new sources of funding, such as grants. Back to you. And nothing like hands-on experience. Aaron McLaughlin, thanks so much. And spring is just around the corner, and most of the country is starting to see the first traces of leaves and buds. But here in California, the decades-long super bloom is in full swing, and it is a showstopper. NBC's Liz Kreutz has more. As spring emerges all around Southern California, the hills are alive with the sound of... Displays of San Verbena. Dune evening primrose. That's actor Joe Spano, seen on NCIS. Now we can do one of two things here. And in Apollo 13. Welcome. And heard on one of California's most quirky traditions, the wildflower hotline. What is it that gives you so much joy about being part of this hotline every year? There's no downside to beautiful flowers coming out of the ground. The weekly telephone hotline started 41 years ago by the Theodore Payne Foundation, a way for the group's botanist to let fellow flower enthusiasts find the best spring blooms. Pick up the phone and call. Yeah, just pick up the phone and call. I mean, there's something, <laughs> you know, charming about it, right? Now, getting to some of the most popular spots, like here in the Anza Borrego Desert, does require a drive. But for all these colors, folks say it's worth it. And this is just the start of the season. Experts say just wait. This year's rain could lead to another super bloom, like recent years in the Carrizo Plain and Antelope Valley. Imagine someone taking a paintbrush and just flinging paint across the hills. I'm glad we did this. <laughs> that vision is what brought Shandini Sharma all the way from Oklahoma, showing it off to her friend in India. It's just so beautiful and so colorful. So colorful. I dreamt of it all night. A simple yet extraordinary pleasure preserved by painters. Can you turn the other way? photographers, and a voice sharing this natural wonder with the world. We have the right conditions for an excellent wildflower viewing season. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you Monday, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.